Welcome to this week's edition of Freedom and Prosperity Radio. We're the weekly radio news magazine put together by all the folks at the Virginia Institute for Public Policy. You can find out more about everything we are into, including our Tuesday morning group coalition and all of our policy work that we continue to do, no matter who is the majority party in the Virginia General Assembly, at virginiainstitute.org. And please join us on our journey. You can find archive episodes of this program at YouTube and just search Freedom and Prosperity Radio. I forget which. It may have been Stalin. It may have been Lenin. It might have been McCartney. But somebody said once, it's not who votes, it's who counts the votes. And uh, we've heard all the ugly things. You don't have to be Hayden Von Sprocket or whatever his name was from Georgia to tell you all about all of the mucking around in our election countings. Hayden Ludwig is on with us, a senior investigative researcher with the Capitol Research Center. Hayden, welcome back to the program. How are you doing, sir? Joe, I'm great. It's good to be with you. Uh, And don't forget daylight savings time this weekend. So if you're waking up saying, this is on already, uh, you probably didn't check your clock uh, there. Uh, Hayden, uh, well, let's jump in with the big ticket, and then I'm going to narrow it down to something that came out of Virginia's statewide audit. Uh, But I want to start with Mark Zuckerberg and the Center for Technology and Civic Life. Uh, It's such a warm and fuzzy sounding organization. How could it possibly be (laughs) dastardly? But if I'm not mistaken, I've checked the number a couple of times, this group gave more money to the Philadelphia Board of Elections than Philadelphia did uh, and, uh, and really targeted four battleground cities, never mind states. Talk, talk a little bit about what Mark Zuckerberg invested in the 2020 elections. So you mentioned it already, Center for Technology and Civic Life, or CTCL. This is a group that exactly nobody had ever heard of before uh, November 2020, and there's a good reason why. If you go back and you look at its its IRS nonprofit filing, you'd find that its total revenues before the 2020 election were somewhere in the ballpark of $2 million. And yet in September and October, we suddenly find out that Mark Zuckerberg, the big Facebook billionaire, is dumping $350 million into this sleepy Chicago nonprofit. Now, why? What did they do? Well, CTCL started funneling that $350 million into pretty much every state on the map, but particularly battleground states. So this $350 million that's supposed to, quote-unquote, help with COVID-19 problems, right? But in a year where you have vote-by-mail and sorts of all sorts of the scandals that came out of that, what we found is that they basically funded efforts to help Democrats grease the skids for voter turnout, mail-in ballots, all the things that created this perfect storm that helped Democrats um, oust President Trump in 2020. Yeah, the vote harvesting alone was funded in a lot of cases by this, you know, helping people go out and just get baskets full of votes where it was allowed, uh, and even lobbying in some small cases uh, on behalf of this kind of uh, legislation where it was actually done appropriately. Yeah, we looked at eight different states trying to trace as many grants from CTCL as we could. So it's important to remember they go to individual county and city elections officials. So you mentioned Philadelphia. Philadelphia is one of the biggest ones, $10 million given in 2020. And for most of these grants, we don't know exactly how they spent them because we just see the name, the amount of the grant come through. But this one in Philly, we managed to find the actual contract, and it's fascinating. It stipulates that the city of Philadelphia had to use its money on things like providing postage for mail-in ballots what? for so many people. Yep. It had to post. This is this is the most important one. They had to place, um, quote-unquote, secure drop boxes all around the city of Philadelphia. Mm. Now, you may not have seen this. I saw these in Washington, D.C. right before the election. They're these huge boxes, bigger than a person, that easily hold hundreds of ballots. Mm-hmm. And they're not run by the post office. So these things were scattered around, and the idea is you could, you could drop off your ballot, and you're safe, right? You don't have to go to a polling place because you're terrified of getting the coronavirus. Well, maybe, but what really happened with these things is people, if they wanted to harvest ballots, they had a place to easily dump off, you know, truckloads of the things in here. Mm-hmm. No oversight. You don't have to provide an AID. There's nobody sitting there monitoring these things. And I'm not an election lawyer, but I've been told by people who, who know what they're talking about that actually, if you're caught doing um, any kind of fraud, putting things into these boxes, 
that it doesn't count as mail fraud because it's not overseen by the U.S. Post Office. Yeah, that was the fun little loophole they dug into this uh, rule about the drop boxes. Because they weren't run by the uh, post office, you're actually, for the most part, you know, maybe you pay a fine. Yeah, exactly. So what we see is CTC yelled it itself didn't necessarily break the law everywhere it sent money. Uh, though there are problems with that, and there's lawsuits flying about whether they did in certain states like Georgia or even Texas. What we saw is if people wanted to cheat, if they wanted simply to to harvest ballots in neighborhoods, which we know happens every election cycle, people go to prison for that sort of thing Mm -hmm. every election cycle, then CTCL basically made your life a whole heck of a lot easier to do that. Well, and that's the part that, uh, as I talked to a former member of Congress, he said they didn't legalize voter fraud, but they made it impossible to catch and impossible to prosecute uh, because any of the evidence would be sort of ambiguous in and of itself. We saw those here. uh, And, and, you know, part of the issue with this election was was this decentralized electioneering. Uh, Some communities were able to put watchers on these drop boxes for a few hours a day. Uh, neither you know, was a political party able to put poll watchers at each one of these boxes all the time. Uh, so you had no idea. Then on top of it, you start finding actual mailboxes gutted in Richmond uh, in the 7th Congressional District where uh, I think it was uh, six or seven mailboxes out in front of a post office. They came in on a Sunday morning and they had all been sawed open with some sort of you know industrial saw and gone through and who knows how many ballots were there uh so so really you know first phase is decentralize everything so it's impossible to watch everything and then send in people who say oh we can help you watch uh we're a nonprofit, uh and uh, we'll help your stressed state board of elections yeah well exactly i mean it's the outrages are endless right i mean it's this this hideous hypocrisy of the left that's now celebrating ccl for and i'm i'm quoting here saving democracy or saving the 2020 election. And I have to laugh because these are the same leftists who, who find it uh, totally objectionable. We, sh- we can't privatize garbage collection, but they're A-OK with privatizing an election. Right. You know, with a tax-exempt nonprofit running all these things, it's absolutely outrageous. Somebody sent me a report. Jimmy Carter and his group, James Baker, you know, saw an issue with something like this in some South American country and excoriated the government for permitting uh, this sort of, you know, private electioneering going on. Uh, and yet you, you ask them about the 2020 election and they're just happy with the outcome. So they seem to be moot on it. Hayden Ludwig is the senior investigative researcher at the Capitol Research Center. We're talking about uh, the way big tech, uh, Mark Zuckerberg specifically, infiltrated the 2020 election is part of it. And I don't want to take you out of your comfort zone or your milieu in, in general. But I look at the way our government takes in trillions of dollars, billions of dollars in the Virginia government and and then turns around and turns their pockets inside out when one of their supposed, and this is their words, not mine, most important parts of our civic life is voting, and we treat our boards of elections like uh, part-time soup kitchens. And then we're surprised when there's security breaches. We need, a, I mean, it certainly seems like something they should commit a little bit more resource to out of a budget. I'm not saying they should add to the budget, but they should take it away from some of the nonsense that they spend the budget on and uh, send it to the State Board of Elections for more serious, full-time, you know, vetted people. Well, yeah, and, and I agree. I mean, I think, I think, is there a motive there for, te- for them to use the coronavirus as a cover to do what they really want to do? Yeah, I absolutely think so. Um, maybe there are budget shortfalls, but the answer is that you turn to tax-exempt organizations because what if what if the conservative side did this? What if Trump, you know, uh, mm-hmm. contacted a bunch of billionaire conservative donors and said, "Hey, we need you to use 501c3 public charities to help make sure we get out the right number of people to vote and just make sure they vote conservative." I mean, it would be outrageous. Even conservatives would be outraged by mm-hmm. it, and they should be because there's a reason we have boards of officials who run our elections. There's a reason we have departments of elections, and it's so that we don't have to have, um, you know, private nonprofits that get tax breaks for doing these sorts of things, right? It's why we don't have them running our elections. Mm-hmm. I mean, the fact is we found $4 million of the $350 million, $4 million traced to just Virginia. 
And you look at where that money goes. Now, I did the breakdown on all of this, and I looked at um, as many, I found 39 different counties and independent cities out of 133 in Virginia. I found where all that money went, and you won't be surprised at all to know the biggest grants, six- and seven-figure grants, went to four counties all in the Potomac area, Mm -hmm. right? Loudoun, Arlington, Fairfax. Fairfax alone got $1.4, almost $1.5 million from CPCL. Wow. And then you do the numbers on these things. Well, you know, Democrats might say this is where the most number of people live. You know, about a quarter of Virginia lives up in the in Northern Virginia area. Well, that's true. But that's also where the Democrats manage to find about 48 to 49 percent of their votes every election cycle. So is it a coincidence? Mm-hmm. I have a hard time seeing congressional Democrats say, well, if a Republican did this, you know, that's fair. It's just where the number of Republican voters live. It's just a total coincidence. Yeah, right. Yeah. We know they'd be calling us hypocrites and saying we stole the election. Well, and if their goal is to help people vote, you know, those are urban areas where generally the polling places aren't as far away as, say, if they went down to Wythe County, where, you know, you might have to drive a, a half hour to the nearest polling place. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, I'll give you an example of just how, how much the numbers break down. So I said we found $4 million flung to Virginia. That's just what we found, by the way. It's probably even higher than that. I just can't find those things. Um, but there's of those 39 counties that got money from CDCL, 14 of them went to Biden. Well, that doesn't sound like a lot until you realize 90% of the $4 million that went to the entire state went to 14 counties that went to Biden. Three and a half, three point six million dollars went to just Biden counties. Those Biden counties gave him over a million votes. That's almost half of his total number of votes in Virginia. So if, if like I said, maybe that's not illegal. Maybe it should be illegal. That's for other people to make up their minds about. But the simple fact is, if CTCL wanted to help Democrats, they would have picked exactly these counties that they did pick. Right. If they wanted to help Republicans, they would not have picked those counties. If they were serious about just helping everybody get out and vote, they would have seen a much more equitable, fair distribution of all this funds and not target it into Democratic strongholds. Well, and and as somebody once pointed out, one is the best way to find hide fraudulent Democrat votes is uh, to cast them in an already heavily Democrat area because they're not going to seem like such a statistical anomaly. If all of a sudden Joe Biden carried Campbell County, uh, then somebody might say, "Um, can we go through those ballots again, please? Uh, But if he carries Fairfax County, okay, duh, he was going to anyway. So, you know, it's it's a better place to pad the numbers, I guess, uh, if if you looked at this cravenly. Uh, and, and, you know, and started to say, well, you know, nobody's going to look twice if Joe Biden wins Loudoun County. Yeah, I think that's true. I think they're very strategic about it. Um, I, I looked at eight different states very closely, and what I found is only a couple counties across eight states actually flipped from one direction, and that direction was always from Trump to Biden. Mm-hmm. Now, it's interesting because that could sound like it's saying that, well, CTCL really didn't help. But that's, I'd say, because CTCL gave most of its money to um, places that were already Democratic strongholds that was going to win, like Loudoun or Fairfax. There's just mm-hmm. no way Trump was going to win those. But the few places that did flip are really telling. If you know anything about Arizona, Arizona, about three-fifths of all the voters, maybe it's four-fifths of all voters in the entire state of Arizona live in Maricopa County that's centered on yeah. Phoenix. That's the only county in the entire state of Arizona that flipped from Trump in 2016 to Biden. It also happens to be the place that got the most, by far, the largest CTCL grant. We saw Biden got 62 percent of his statewide total in Maricopa County alone. That's double the number of votes that Hillary Clinton got four years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, if CTCL is right, they helped people get out and vote, right? I mean, that's what they're saying they did. Well, we just want to help everybody get out and vote, do their civic, civic duty. Well, then you're really strategic about choosing the one place that if you flip it from Trump to Biden, all the guarantees that Biden wins the entire state of Arizona, which I'll point out hasn't happened for a Democrat in decades. 
Right. So and, you're awfully specific about which counties you chose to give the most money to, if that's what you wanted to do. Well, and were they going to conservative homes? Were they going down a call list? And I've seen them. I've worked uh, the, the phone banks. You know, you get the hard R's, the soft R's, the hard D's, the soft D's, who voted in primaries. You got to have all that data. Did they go down the list and try to get out the vote amongst the hard R's? Or did they just go on one political party? And part of that is what you mentioned earlier, Hayden, is our election officials are sworn officers of the state. They they take an oath to uphold the law, and there are serious ramifications if they don't live up to that oath. Uh, somebody who's just working for a nonprofit as a part-timer, uh, volunteering during their college internship, they have no such oath. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, I, I think what this really highlights is people are coming to see what's been true for decades, and that's that you know the left plays hardball with nonprofits that get actively involved in things like voter registration or get out the vote drives, and the right simply doesn't. I mean, a huge chunk of my job is simply uncovering all of these get out the vote groups. Mm-hmm. They're all 501c3 groups, just like your church, just like, you know, any, any charitable group out there. I mean, you get a tax deduction for doing all these things. And the simple fact is that the right has almost no such nonprofits that focus on getting um, people registered to vote in particularly conservative areas because they're afraid of the IRS coming down on them like a ton of bricks because the IRS is really specific about what you can and cannot do. Yeah. It can't be partisan. It can't even look partisan. And the right is very cautious about that, I think, is which is why they don't engage in it, even though they probably should, because the left goes whole hog on this and registers tens of millions of people. They brag about it on their websites. We catch them all the time, mm-hmm. bragging about how many people they registered to vote in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. <laughs> yeah, of course. You know, not down in the middle of red state, uh, <laughs> Texas, uh, Pennsylvania, yeah. but right exactly where you'd expect them to be focusing. Well, let me ask you this, Hayden, uh, and we talk about Mark Zuckerberg and the Center for Technology and Civic Life. Uh, and how it mysteriously all of a sudden became a player in this. But I, a, a, a couple of phrases came out of Virginia's 2020 election audit um, just last week. And uh, Chris Piper thanked a, an organization called Voting Works, which is uh, a, a, a division of the Center for Democracy and Technology, which sounded enough familiar to Mark Zuckerberg's work, where I went and dug. And this is a group that was started um, by the uh, uh, ACLU lawyer Jerry Berman in 1994 after he started the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Even Influence Watch calls CDT a left-leaning organization. It's funded by uh, the Foundation to Promote Open Society and the Ford Foundation and by Facebook on top of it. So Mark Zuckerberg is in this this and and never mind their connection to Kaspersky. Uh, But so here's another tech group that's been around since Motor Voter and Bill Clinton in the 90s. And it is doing the same thing and is apparently helping the Commonwealth of Virginia do our election audit. Yeah. And Foundation of Prone Open Society, that's George Soros, of course. Yeah, I think I think you you perfectly highlighted that the left has really um, in in recent years it's made big strides towards creating organizations that are just as left wing as anything else, but pretend to be well, we're you know impartial monitors in the middle. You can trust us. You can cite us. We see this stuff all the time. Um, one of one of the things that I've worked on is unearthing this seven hundred and thirty one million dollar a year nonprofit network run right here in Washington, D.C., by a company called Arabella Advisors. This is as dark money as it comes. And they run groups called, and I love this, Fix the Court, which, of course, they have no sense of irony or humor, so they don't understand what Fix the Court actually means to most of us. But it's all about, you know, reforming the Supreme Court. And so it puts out all these studies on things like this on our elections, on our courts, etc. And I find groups in government or, or regular people all the time who cite these guys as impartial experts who are just providing good knowledge. Never mind the fact that this isn't even a real organization. It's a front for a multi-million dollar dark money group funded by the lefty, uh, you know, the lefty's lefty. I mean, these are not guys who are interested in promoting real facts. They're trying to pass an agenda, mm-hmm. and they know if they admit what they are, how, how ideological they actually are, most people are going to be turned off by that. So if they pretend to be something in the middle with, without an axe to grind, 
And I love this. They'll always call themselves nonpartisan. Now, when you hear that term nonpartisan, yeah. what that's really referring to is that they're not aligned with a political party. Well, you know what? Every 501c3 and c4 organization in America is nonpartisan because the IRS says you can't actively be aligned with a political party. But that doesn't mean you're non-ideological. Right. You have an axe to grind. You're trying to push something. So when people hide behind this, oh, well, we're nonpartisan, it oftentimes doesn't mean anything because, well, yeah, if you weren't, you wouldn't be legally allowed to exist. But that's the issue is, you know, they're hiding and, they're, and then they're t- collecting all this money tax exempt while guys like Bernie Sanders tell me that all these rich guys are, you know, behaving with impunity when it comes to uh, their taxes. And uh, we've got these organizations who are out there we, we, we playing fast and loose with our elections while also getting the same tax exem- exemptions. The hypocrisy is knee deep. Well, I'll give you even, even more, too, than that. Uh- you know, the, on the left, many many of their leading thinkers and scholars consider the idea of tax exemption to be equivalent to a federal subsidy, you know, because that's money the federal government would have collected via tax. So if they don't collect it, well, it's, it's the same thing as subsidizing your activities, which is just so outrageous. But if you hold their own standard to what they do, then they're telling you that they federally subsidize all of these activities like CTCL because those are tax exempt. I mean, it's just they're just rich in irony and hypocrisy. It's all they have, really. And when you catch them on it, they say, but they're doing the good work of trying to get, you know, the poor old lady out to vote that wouldn't have voted otherwise. uh, Or, you know, this poor soul who certainly would have wanted to vote for Joe Biden had they not succumbed to COVID-19 and are now passed away. Uh, So, you know, (laughs) I'm sorry. I was like, uh, and, and, and again, as you said, this isn't new. Bob Dole, when he was leaving the, the public s- uh, scene, he said he hopes to retire to Chicago. That way, when he passes away, he can stay active in politics. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know. And I think Bob Dole's stand-up career really was cut short. Uh, but, but so this is not new stuff. This is all stuff that's been going on since we've been voting, and partially, I, I believe, not to get again get into the existential of government. Why Madison didn't want a pure democracy? He knew that this kind of stuff could happen with just voting for everything. Um, you know, so you have some things are driven by popular votes, some things weren't. And that was the way the country was originally uh, constructed, thus the phrase checks and balances. Yeah, I, I think you're right, actually. I, I would agree that there's a reason we have a republic. And there's a reason, too, why we have a strong, we call it the nonprofit sector, but, you know, that goes back to before the founding. Right. I mean, if you remember Alexei de Tocqueville coming here and talking about, the, you know, everything the French do, they, they choose the government to do it. But the Americans, they form little civic organizations. Mm-hmm. They form little committees to do it themselves. And, and, you know, the sad thing is, is I talk a lot about this tax exemption because I, I find it particularly outrageous what they use that tax exemption yeah. to do. But if you go back, that's a hundred year old tax exemption. It goes back to about World War I and the first um, national income tax. And the reason they did that is it was codifying an understanding between the American people and their government that goes back to well before the revolution that says that, look, we understand we don't want everything to be done by government. There are certain things that are done better by private citizens banding together to figure out the best way to do it themselves. And so, you know, we'll reward that with a tax um, deduction when you make donations there, and we'll make sure we don't tax those organizations so they can... This is like churches. It's why we do that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the United States is one of the only countries in the world that does this. There's only two or three I know of that now do this. When we did it 100 years ago, we were the only ones. And so it's a very uniquely American thing that you find the left, because the left doesn't really know how to create anything. They only know how to destroy. They warp that. They, they corrupt that, and they turn it into... This monstrosity of, oh, you created 501c3 groups to do genuine charity. Well, I'll just call my political get out the vote work charitable, and mm-hmm. now I can do without it with impunity, right? Mm-hmm. And Absolutely. It should, it, should, it should frustrate everybody. And it doesn't, and that's the problem. And it's that, uh, uh, again, Marx said, get rid of right and wrong, and then the outcome becomes the only thing. I'm paraphrasing, of course. Uh, I may be a better writer than he was. Uh, but in any event, uh, not as famous, though. Uh, we do have to run, though. Hayden Ludwig, senior investigative researcher at the Capital Research Center. Thank you for everything. People can read all this stuff, though, if they go to capitalresearch.org, correct? That's right. Capital with an A-L at the end. Yes, that's right. That's right. Uh, I appreciate it as always. You have a wonderful weekend. 
You too, my friend. Take care. Up next, Director of Policy with Tertium Quids, Caleb Taylor, and the gig economy on Freedom and Prosperity Radio.